God. Uh, we're going to yeah talk just a little bit about God's Ten Commandments. And uh, I put this up this morning. One of the reasons that the Ten Commandments, and I believe there are some places around the country that believe that the Ten Commandments aren't for today. There are other things that replace it. I don't believe so. I believe Jesus fulfilled every one of these commandments. And so they're for us today, uh, even though it's from the Mosaic Law. And uh, so I'm not a crazy uh, dispensational person that thinks that that was for another time, I believe. And I'll show you why it's for our time. I'll show you in the Word. Uh, but I believe these are a remedy to the wokeness that we face today. These will keep us safe from any of the subtleties of what we hear on the radio, television, internet, whatever, uh, that talk about wokeness, because wokeness is, uh, is a horrible thing that has come to our, uh, it's been with us for probably about 10 years now, and, uh, and, and I'll get into, uh, I won't explain it now, but I'll get into it in just a minute. I want you to see a couple of scriptures before we get into the Ten Commandments. And this is uh, it, where the Ten Commandments are. This first scripture is in Exodus 20.20. 20. And it says this, Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you. I've got that underlined because I want you to remember that, okay? God has come to prove you. Because people that believe um, in, uh, in certain dispensations throughout history that God has worked with people in different ways. Yes, he has worked with people in different ways, but he's always, he's always brought his word out to people uh, in times of trouble and need, and they're all over the scripture, amen? So uh, they say that God is, you know, has proven people in different ways in different generations. I believe this verse tells us that the Ten Commandments are there to prove us. Amen? Yeah. We follow those commandments. It's a way of God proving us. Ver, uh, read on. And that his fear may be, be before your faces, that ye sin not. What is the purpose of the fear of the Lord? That we don't sin. And there's scripture after scripture that tell us that. Amen? And so God has, has made a way uh, where we're, we're not sinning, where we're not siding with the enemy. And that's basically what it is. Sinning is siding with the enemy. It's disobey, and of course, it's disobeying God. And so we're uh, we, we're against, you know we're against that because God's against it. Proverbs eight thirteen says this: the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth. Do I hate? So this is David ta or uh, Solomon talking. And he's, he's saying the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And so you see that, that hatred of evil, because God hates it, he doesn't hate the people that do it, but he certainly hates the sin, and we do too. And praise God, we have a remedy for that sin. Jesus died on a Roman cross to save us from our sins. And so uh, we live in holiness unto the Lord. Amen? So he says here... <laughs> The fear of the Lord is to hate pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward, contrary mouth. And that's what the Ten Commandments stand against. It, it protects us against doing these things. Pride, arrogancy, uh, a froward mouth, which means a contrary mouth to the Word of God. That's what it means. A contrary mouth to the Word of God in every evil way. And so, this message, I'm going to say is my uh, continuation of it's time to take a deep breath. It's time to really take inventory in our lives and understand that we need to devote ourselves to what God has said, right? Mm -hmm. We need to devote ourselves to what he said so it will keep us safe, so it will keep us strong, and we can be vessels of the Lord to stand against this incessant, insane wokeness mm -hmm. that is being pushed uh, on our children. Amen. Amen. The, uh, in the beginning of the year, I spoke at the commissioner's meeting and I said this uh, because I put it into a, a summation of what we've been doing uh, at the library with the school board and other places. Uh, and I, I summed it this way, that uh, what is going on in these, in these entities, these places like the library, is it's a Trojan horse. And mm -hmm. if you don't know uh, the... 
and, and most people will say the legend of the Trojan horse. I'm not convinced it was a legend. This may have actually happened. And I think a lot of things that we call legends, and a lot of people, right. whether they be gods and goddesses or whatever, mm -hmm. have been around as actual people and individual mm -hmm. individuals. All right? I got that out of my system. But I really, you know, I, I see that because I see it fitting into what's going on today, too. So uh, don't try not to call the myths. You know, just tell, tell the story. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to take my own medicine and tell the story. So the procession of the Trojan horse into Troy. And Troy it, it was, um, uh, now I forgot where Troy was. But anyway, it'll come back to me. Um, it, uh, the procession of the Trojan horse into Troy from two sketches depicting the Trojan horse. Oil on canvas by Giovanni Domenico. And uh, it's in the National Gallery in London. It, of course, great Italian painters. All right, moment of glory here. Anyway, awesome. But you see these people pulling this Trojan horse into um, the city of Troy, where there has been a war. The Greeks are on the outside. Of course, the, uh, Troy, the people of Troy are on the inside of the city. Uh, the, and uh, these Greeks are pulling this Trojan horse in and this was a gift to Troy uh, to the goddess Athena, all right, to the goddess Athena. And Athena was a female goddess, uh, part of this overall plan. Uh, you, we in, the Christi in Christianity have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Yes. Our trinity. The pagan trinity is usually Father, Son, and Queen. That's the, usually the pagan tr trinity. Father, son, and, trin and queen, or goddess. And so uh, we, we take a lesson. This, this horse was to brought into the city to get, pay homage to this queen. All right? Uh, some churches call her the queen of heaven. We won't get into that. But anyway, um, you get the picture here. Now... Uh, we have this Trojan horse going into Troy, and of course what happens when the horse goes into Troy, I'll read the whole story in just a minute, but uh, the soldiers jump out of this horse, it was hollowed out, and uh, they were able to go open the gates and let all the troops in and sack the, the city of Troy, okay? So uh, anything, anything that is hidden, anything that is um, cloaked in something, we'll call it, uh, we can call wokeness, and you'll see that in just a minute. So, uh, in New York City, we have this uh, statue that was put up, and this was brought to you courtesy of wokeness and paganism. Um, basically, this is a statue, supposedly, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> now, <laughs> so thank you, Ed, that's the appropriate response. Okay. The reason she looks like Ruth Bader Ginsburg is because she has lace on her collar. Nothing else in this picture resembles, and, and we, we're laughing, but this was put on a courthouse, a district courthouse mm -hmm. that hears federal cases in New York City to give honor, supposedly, to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We, we know this is a pagan statue. Yes. We know this is signaling. We know this is signaling wokeness uh, to, to bring uh, propaganda to our young people and to turn and twist history. Beloved, we have a history and some of us have lived a long time like me and Lee and, and well, we won't go any further. But anyway, thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you. you're welcome. And so, uh, but we remember history and we don't ever want to forget history, okay? Now, Ruth Ginsburg did not look like this. She didn't have ram's horns, which are picked, uh, you know, there are pictures of other gods. We can, I could put up a whole pantheon of different things that are worshipped as God uh, with these kind of horns on their head. Of course, it's a female. It's a picture of a goddess. It's a picture of, of, of the, you know, what the New World Order wants us to understand and realize. And so this is all creeping in under the title of wokeness. Wokeness is a Trojan horse that gets people to believe in this crazy wacky stuff and it's getting a lot of people to believe it believe me 
our permanent political class truly believes it. All right? So uh, this statue is basically two sides of the same coin. It's pagan syncretism. And uh, it, on this building, it joins statues of uh, Zoroaster, or Z Zoroaster, uh, however you pronounce that, Confucius, but guess who else is up on that courthouse? Moses, the lawgiver. Our Moses. And, and they put her up there near Moses. I, thank goodness they didn't put her next to Moses, but they put her up there. And we've watched some programs about the, the uh, significance of this and the signals that this thing sends. But this basically, if you look at her arms, look at her arms. Reminds you of that uh, goddess Medusa, yep. right? Yep. Doesn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and the way she's standing up there is an ex almost an exact representation of the Jewish goddess Lilith. If you look at it, and uh, it's gone, uh, Lilith has gone by other names and known by other names, and we won't get into those, but you, you see how they're trying to poison, especially this is targeted at our young people. Because us old folks, we don't buy this at all. But the young people buy it hook, line, and sinker. And so there's a, uh, this cloaked, I call it cloaked and woke, the new Trojan horse, and how do we protect ourselves? And I'm going to make the case this morning like a judge in, in a jury, or a lawyer before a jury, that we protect ourselves with the Ten Commandments. We protect ourselves with God's Word. All right. So in 1194 to 1184 B.C., that's ten years, besieging the walls of Troy, for ten years the Greeks built a huge hollow wooden horse, secretly filled it with armed warriors, like Charlotte said, and presented it to the Trojans as a gift for the goddess Athena, and the Trojans took the horse inside the city walls. That night, the armed Greeks swarmed out and captured and burned the city. A Trojan horse is thus anything that looks innocent, but once accepted, has the power to harm or destroy. And we hear this over and over and over again with wokeness. No, this is here to help somebody. This is here to help somebody. I've got a couple of uh, magazines that I brought that put on the video. But this is one. Uh, one of the uh, New American Magazine. It's a magazine we get from the John Birch Society. It says, When Children Cancel Parents. This is because of wokeness. This is because of a propaganda that's being pushed on our youth. Number one. Number two. Uh, the UN's New World Religion. All right, so I want you to understand that all of this that is being taught, all this wokeness, is religion. If it's in, it cloaked in climate change, it's religion. It worships the goddess, um, oh, what's her name, Ga Gaia. Worships Gaia, the planet Earth. On the Georgia Guidestones, it talks about that, that man is a cancer on the face of this earth, and he has to be <laughs> exterminated down to... I, uh, five, what, what was it, 500 million people, something yes. like that. Ridiculous things. But yet, people are all stand, you know, all behind that. All, yeah, yeah, we need to do that. Yeah, too many people on this earth. Yeah, we need five planets to support the life that we have on planet Earth. That's a lot of nonsense. There's no volunteers. Yeah. Right, exactly. No volunteers. And number two, it's pagan religion. Interesting how God said at, in the beginning of time, be fruitful and multiply. multiply. Yeah. And then they're saying, oh, no, don't multiply. You can't do that. There's right. not enough room. Right. But God says, be fruitful, multiply. Right. Mm. And then we want, you, we want you dead so that we can control the people that are alive and make them our slaves. And I'm not ashamed to say that or afraid to say that because it's the truth, right? So this is the new Trojan horse. This is what we fight hard against uh, every day of our lives, basically. Uh, we, we've taken this on because we know uh, the importance of doing this because we know history. We know history. We, we, we know a lot of things. We, we, we have books. We have encyclopedias that tell us that, that the, these people actually existed. And then all of a sudden, later on, because of government intervention and so forth, these encyclopedias say they're myths. 
You know, well, no, they're the truth. I, I trust what was spoken back in the 1800s and things like that. So, um, number two. Uh, so to discredit these uh, claims in wokeness, uh, or actually to discredit the Ten Commandments, the group called the uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation wrote this, that, sarcastically, about the Ten Commandments. They said this, do study the Ten Commandments. Well, wasn't that nice of them to say that? They epitomize childlessness, vindictiveness, vindictiveness, sexism, and the inflexibility of inadequacies of the Bible as a book of morals. Little in Christianity is original. Listen to this nonsense. Little in Christianity is original. Most of it is borrowed, just as the celebration of Christmas was borrowed from the Romans, and it was in earlier pagan times, when the Lord supposedly wrote his commandments on two tablets of stone and delivered them to Moses. By the way, I put in there, that's in Deuteronomy 5.22. He was only aping earlier gods, Bacchus, Zoroaster, and Minos. And we have people in academia, in Christian academia, teaching in Christian colleges, that are saying that this is true. Moses stole from the gods, from the pagans, things, and put together the Ten Commandments and the law in Israel. That's what they're saying. Now, it's, it's actually the reverse. Yeah, it is. It is. And, 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 and I'm glad you brought that up because... Uh, uh, Zoroaster borrowed from the Bible. Not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you do a study on Zoroaster, you'll find out he borrowed a lot from Moses. And so this freedom from religion foundation to say, no, it's the other way around. Moses borrowed from the pagans. No, that's not true. Absolutely nothing. Uh, beware when somebody says, I'm going to fundamentally transform something. All right, we have a whole office now here in Gillette on fundamentally transforming our city. All right, being funded by the federal government. Uh, I, I'm suspect of that. Anyway, uh, be careful because it, when it says uh, we're going to fundamentally transform, that means it's going to be wrapped in wokeness to convince a group of people about social justice. Years ago, we called social justice, by the way, the social gospel. So we came out against it, but now uh, people are afraid to come out against it. And that's the reason why. They get all these things in. They get all these things passed because people are afraid to say something about it. They're afraid to say that the statue up on top of, uh, of the courthouse, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is anything but beautiful because if you say anything else about it, you're, you're, you're called all these names, right? You're shamed. You're insulted. Uh, you're called a bigot, you're called a homophobe, you're called an anti-Semite because she was Jewish. See, this is a religion. Exactly. Mm -hmm. With a hierarchy that says, you can say this, but you can't say that. And what Jesus said about religion, he came to get rid of it. Yeah. So they just buried themselves a few of men. Yeah, exactly. This kind of religion he came to, came to destroy. So I want you to kind of understand that. And then we'll go over uh, the Ten Commandments. This shouldn't take too long. Here's the, qu here's the question, and I think I have it phrased in the beginning. Um, you know, how do we protect ourselves from this wokeness? How do we protect ourselves? And this is, number one, by studying the Ten Commandments, we can understand how not to take the Lord's name in vain. How not to. Because a lot of people think, well, taking the Lord's name is in vain is to actually speak his name uh, and use it as a, as, a, as a curse word or some type, type of word to get your attention. All right? And they call that uh, profanity, not profanity, but uh, taking his name, Lord's name in vain. But, I, I, you know, I, that's part of it, obviously. It really is. But there's a deeper understanding of what taking the Lord's name is in vain. Okay? So, uh, when the Hebrews used to recite the Ten Commandments or look at the commandments, they used to say this. It's on the screen. This is Torah that Moses set before the Israelites by the command of the Lord through Moses. And so, before they read the commandments 
or before they read the Torah, they would always say that. This is the Torah that Moses set before the Israelites by the command of the Lord through Moses. Now, how many of you remember on my first slide, and I can go back to it real fast, it said, uh, God has come to prove you. Mm -hmm. Okay, God has come to prove you. And then on some of the other slides, it said that M Moses borrowed Moses borrowed these words. I want you to see right out of the box what God said in Exodus 21. This is Moses writing down what God said. And it says this, And God spoke all these words. God spoke them. Not Zoroaster, not Minos. God spoke them. Say. So nothing is borrowed from anything. These are the words of God. There it is right there. Number two, verse two. And this is laid out kind of like a resolution. Okay, uh, Whereas, uh, verse two. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. It's a very legal statement say, saying, I have taken you out of bondage. I'm not going to take you back into bondage. Instead, I brought you out to bring you in to my purposes, to my land, mm -hmm. to living, living for me and listening to my words. It's a very legal term. So it's like a resolution being proclaimed. Whereas, for this reason, uh, God took us out of the house of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So verse 3 says, uh, and these are my words, okay, be it resolved, it's like a resolution, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Right? Since I brought you out of, of, the, of the pagan world, and that's what God did for every one of us. He brought us out of paganism. And believe me, before we got saved, we were pagans. We, we did the things that pagans did. And Paul said, you're not that way anymore. That was what you once were. Not anymore. You shall have no other gods beside me. Okay? Because Why? Why don't we, why don't we look, play with those gods? Maybe they have something to offer. No, their wisdom is deadly. The wisdom of the gods is deadly, and it's still around today, and there's a lot of people that live by it that are, that are they're going to suffer horrible consequences because of it. So verse 4 tells us the rationale behind why God spoke this to Moses. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, nor likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, watch the distinction, or the earth beneath, or the water under the earth. wonder what that is. Subterranean Yeah. Yeah. And so evidently, <laughs> there, are, there are images down there too. Now, I won't get into a big discussion on that, but let's... <laughs> it says it right there. So I don't know how we're going to put that into our, you know, into our pipe and smoke it, but there are beings under the earth that uh, we're not to make graven images of. And, and the pagan world knows that, and they do that, and they make images out of the things that they know to be under the earth. All right? So I'll let you process that. Praise God. But that's what the Word of God says. This is a preserved text. All right? Verse 5. Thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And I know that got Oprah Winfrey upset, but that's just the way he is. He's a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. All right, so this doesn't only affect the person who's involved in it, but it affects future generations, and they know this. The wokeness is going to affect future generations if we don't stop it and try to stop it cold, and we can in the, in the Lord. <coughs> but, verse 6, I know it says end, but I, also, I always like to say, but, they are be preceding it, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Hallelujah. So, whose effect is stronger? The pagan effect or our effect? 
our effect, right? That gener thousands of we influence thousands of generations. The pagans, maybe two or three generations or four. Showing mercy to them that love me and keep my commandments. So here's the be it resolved part in this resolution. Be it resolved. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The big word there in that phrase is take the name of the Lord in vain. When you got saved, you took his name. Just like when you get married, you, if you're a female, you take the name. You take the name of your husband if you're not rebellious. <laughs> did I say that? I guess I did. Okay. I'm glad you're assisting. <coughs> anyway, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So that's what taking the name of the Lord is. You're taking it in vain, and then you're doing other things besides what you should be doing as a person who has taken the Lord into their life. <coughs> they should be obeying the Lord and not disobeying the Lord and taking his name in vain. Are you with me on that one? For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And so the, the word vanity in Strong's uh, that interprets the Greek words, okay, for us, and has been doing that since the 1800s. Strong says the word vain, or taking his name in vain, means emptiness, nothingness, vanity. Emptiness of speech. In other words, you speak, maybe you speak the commandments, but you don't obey them, all right? But by the way, that's hypocrisy too, all right? Emptiness of speech, lying against the truth, number C or letter C, Worthlessness of conduct. Worthlessness. When you live for God on this earth, amen, you are not a, you are not a worthless human being. Mm -hmm. you're, a ve you're very, you are worth gold to God. Following His word and following His will. Alright? The, the, only, the only way that uh, the Mosaic uh, law differed a little bit that the atheists are saying that it differed was the recipient of the tithe, the priests given their stations, and uh, I, want, I, want, I even want to ask the question, all right, well, if the recipient of the tithe, if they had three different recipients of the tithe, or if they had uh, different stations for the priests that weren't really found in the Torah, but they had them, Aren't we smart enough, aren't we blessed by God enough to figure these things out, these contradictions out, and not throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, the, w Moses must have borrowed from the gods. We cannot believe anything, anything that the pagan world says. We can't, because it'll, it'll, it'll turn us around. What keeps us safe are the Ten Commandments. Now I'm going to read, uh, read some of these commandments to you. And let me see, I didn't skip any, did I? All right. Uh, so we got those first few there, and then we, we've got another one here, Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. What does that mean to the church? Take the Sabbath. Take a Sabbath. It means you get a day off. Get a day, right? Amen? Take a day. Remember back in the day when I was working, I, had, I, I was brand new on the, on the job, and uh, you know I, I needed the job, and I had to tell my employer, I got I, I got one day off. I had a one day off. When you had a real job? When I had a real job, yeah. <laughs> Good one, Ed. Yep. Some of you don't know what that story is. So. We'll, we'll tell you that. Remember the days of Travis. I remember those days. Amen. Uh, but uh, that's important. That is very important. If you're working seven days a week, you need to look at this. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, where we, 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 we understand what God is asking of us. Amen. Because he wants us to rest. Just like he did. Right? He's six days. On the seventh, he rested. We need a day of rest. And it's important to have a Sabbath where you're not working at all. And a lot of people work seven days a week. And it's, it's just, it isn't right. Amen? Susan and I have made it a practice to take a Sabbath. Actually, on the day it was prescribed 
in the Old Testament. And uh, we, kinda, we stand on that because we, uh, we want to protect ourselves. Verse 12, Honor thy father and thy mother, for thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Praise God. Amen. Have you done that? Amen. My parents are both gone, but I honored them when they were alive. Honored them greatly. And I believe I'm going to have a long life on the face of this earth because of it. Thou shalt not kill, which is murder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to talk a lot about that one, right? Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. That means uh, with the spouse of another. That's uh, idolat adultery. God calls idolatry in a lot of places, which is really interesting. Thou shalt not steal anything. Thou shalt not steal a pencil from thine employer. Right? There we go. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor when it would be an evil, convenient thing to do <laughs> that would teach him a lesson. Right? No false witnesses. Out of the mouth, God says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. That's why uh, shall every matter be established. Protection against wokeness, beloved. That's what this is. Verse 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maidservant, uh, manservant or maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. <laughs> Praise God. If your neighbor is blessed, bless him. Praise God. If he's got a nicer pickup truck than you do, bless him. I'm I'm serious. You, you are going to see such joy in your life. Such joy in your life. Amen? This whole world that we have, is, 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 a lot of it is based on jealousy. Where people want power. And they're, they're, they're power, so power hungry that they'll get, they'll get it from dark sources. Dark people. And dark words instead of the word of God. And we have to be the total polar opposite of them in this world. So number two, keep ourselves safe from wokeness. We understand what taking his name in vain looks like, all right? It's, there's not just a process of, of, of taking his name in vain, but what does it really look like? And what, how does it manifest in our life? And so I want to read quickly Deuteronomy 28, 15, which talks about the first few verses of Deuteronomy 28 are about the blessings of God. We've talked about them a lot. But these are, when you, when you fold your arms and say, that doesn't apply to me in the word of God or whatever, then this is what happens to you when you reject his commandments. Deuteronomy 28, 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments, there it is, right? Including those ten commandments we just read, that the atheists say Moses didn't get from Moses, they got it from pagan gods. That is totally wrong. Observe all God's commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Look at, your, look at yourself in the mirror and say, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. I don't want any of these things to come upon me. So what is God telling us? I'll keep you safe. I'll keep you free from wokeness. I'll keep you free from that influence, that demonic influence that's coming upon our, uh, our children and our people. I'll keep you safe from it. Verse 36. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king, and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee into a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there thou shalt serve other gods, wood and stone. And did that happen? God delivered Israel from Egypt, brought them into the promised land, and eventually had to bring them into Babylon. Mm -hmm. One side of the country, the other. He says, all right, you've had the tour of Egypt. Now, since you're disobedient, you're going to have the tour of Babylon. But anyway, they went into captivity. So this actually came true. This is what it looks like. It, it looks like if God's church doesn't wise up, if God's church doesn't take a stand, Babylon 
is, is, the, is the case that will be made. We will be overtaken by this enemy. That's why we have to stand against it. Verse 37. And thou shalt become an astonishment and a proverb and a byword among all the nations whither the Lord shall lead thee. Amen? So that's going on right now where people are saying about God's people. You know, well, look, they're getting defeated. We're winning. They're getting defeated. They're being brought down low. Look at them. They're, they're shutting their churches down because of COVID. Look at all these things that they're doing. They're listening to the wokeness. And God says, no, you believe my commandments, you believe what I said, you won't be tempted by any wokeness whatsoever. Praise God. Deuteronomy 28, uh, 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee. So they won't, they won't leave you alone and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and statutes which he commanded thee. You know, there are a couple guys outside the wall, and uh, I should have read this story before I came in, but I just thought about it before church. And there were, there were I believe, two men outside the wall. And uh, they were going to die. There was a famine, and, uh, but there was food inside the city. And so they, they looked at each other, and they made this statement to each other. Do you remember what that was? Why sit we here till we die? And that's my question today. And they went in, two of them, with angelic help. They were able to go in, basically pillage the city, and walk out. And it's just a great story. I don't even know the reference to it, but I remember it. And so, this is the case. We don't have to sit here and take it. We don't have to sit here and die. We can go into the city, we can invade the city, and praise God, we can live. And live to testify about the goodness of God. Live to live in this revival that God is bringing to the land. And by the way, beloved, let me tell you something. Why is he moving in the colleges and the universities? Because that's where this wokeness started. I, I don't doubt that there's going to come a day when some of these secular colleges, including maybe the University of Wyoming, that chooses uh, gender studies over... Uh, you know, anyway, I won't get into that. But there'll be a revival on these campuses. Why? Because that's where this propaganda is being propagated. In the colleges. In the colleges. And that's why we're seeing revival break out. In the colleges. Keep that in mind today. Why sit we here till we die? We don't have to sit here and die. We don't have to sit, this and take, sit here and let this overtake us. We stand against it. And we're victorious, praise God. It says here, in verse 46, And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder upon thy seed forever. And not a good sign and a wonder, may I say. Verse 47, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Look, you can live in the abundance of all things. Obey God. God will give you an abundance. He will, praise God. Some more than others. But that's okay. But there'll be an abundance. You'll eat, you'll, you'll drink, your children will be healthy. It, it's, it's, it's God's way. You'll enjoy the abundance of things if you praise Him. So let me read these words of praise in Psalm 13, and I'm finished in the next minute or so. By, so by blessing the name of the Lord, we fight wokeness. This is Psalm 113, and uh, you can read this all week. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. So we praise Him all day long, right? 24-7. That's my, my website. My, not my website, my email. We praise 24-7. Praise God. Mm -hmm. From this scripture here. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Verse 4. The Lord is high above all nations. And His glory above the heavens. Remember that. Amen. He sits above the heavens with His throne, in His throne room, in the third heaven. And He's over everything. Verse 5. Who is like unto the Lord our God? Who dwelleth on high? Listen. He lives in a high and lofty place. But the, the scripture tells us something unique about Him. Verse 6. Who humbleth, humbleth Himself to behold the things that are in heaven and on the earth. 
How about that? All those founding fathers that we had that were deists, uh, this verse says they, uh, that they were wrong. The Lord cranked the earth up and then just did his thing in heaven and left us alone to fend for ourselves. That's not the truth. The truth is that he's paying attention to us. Praise God. Verse 7, he raises up the poor out of the dust. I love this. And lifted the needy out of the dunghill. Hallelujah. Mm. Is that where your life was? Mine was on the dunghill. And he lifted me up. That he may set him with princes. Even with the prince of his people. That's what he treats us like. When we obey him, when we listen to him. We obey his commands. We love the Lord. We listen to Jesus and his commands. The Bible says that he sets us up with princes. And that this last verse, he maketh the barren woman to keep house. He gives her a home. Listen, and he and be to be the joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Beloved, we're live this way, we're not going to be barren. To live this way, we're not going to be living on the dung hill. We're going to be living in the strength and the power and the glory of the Lord. What a day that we live in. Praise God. What a day. And we've got these Ten Commandments, Decalogue, they call them. These Ten Commandments that God has given us that to fight. These are, these are fighting words against all that the enemy is trying to propagate on any of it. We know history. We have eyes. We can see what's going on. We can see the Word of God. We can stand. We can stand. And He's given us the power to stand. We've read several scriptures that tell us that. You're stronger than you think you are. You're mightier than you think you are. And you're bolder than you think you are. And let's stand in that boldness. Let the Word of God motivate you. Let the Spirit of God open up our eyes. And let's glorify the Lord together. Amen? Lord, we thank you this morning. We give you praise. Thank you for this Word. Your Word's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We ask you to bless each person. Amen.